Hello, and welcome to ExpressJS, the most important parts. This course will include topics on what ExpressJS is and why we would want to use ExpressJS as our server side framework, how to set up a server, what's included in the Express scaffold, what middleware means and how to use middleware, how to set up and use different templating for our views, and how to configure and use routing in our Express apps. What you should know. You should already be familiar with JavaScript syntax, and you should have Node.js installed. There are many reasons why Express and Node are a great choice for server-side development. So please join me in this course and learn more about the most important aspects of using Express.js. What is Express? Express.js is defined on their website as a fast, unopinionated, minimalist web framework for Node.js. I personally like to think of Express as a layer built on top of Node that helps manage a server and routing. Why would we want to use Express? Here's a couple of good reasons. Because Express is built on top of Node, it is the perfect framework for ultra-fast input and output. Node.js is both asynchronous and single-threaded, meaning many requests can be made simultaneously without incurring a bottleneck that would slow down processing. The robust API that ships with Express allows us to easily configure routes to send and receive requests from a front end and connect to a database. Hello, in this video, we'll cover the basic setup for installing and configuring an Express-based app. We'll discuss the dash G flag for global installation versus installing Express locally. We'll take a look at what an auto-generated app looks like when using the Express command. We'll take a first look at Jade, which is a templating engine and included in an Express scaffold. And we'll introduce the concept of middleware before digging deeper into middleware in a later video. Okay, so as mentioned in this video, all we're going to do is install Express globally and then take a look at the initial scaffold that Express gives us. So make sure that you have the latest download of Express installed. I'm using Windows 8.1 on 64-bit version, so make sure that you go to Node.js and download whichever version of Node works for you. Alright, so once you have Node installed, we'll start off by installing Express globally. We can just say npm install dash g express. The difference between using the dash g flag and not using the, the dash g flag it will basically allow us to scaffold an express app by simply putting express into the node terminal. Typically when we're installing packages we'll use the dash dash save flag. I'm going to navigate now to a folder that I created for this course called Starter App and I will download a initial Express web app using the command express. So you can see it created a bunch of files really quick. So we'll take a look at each of these. Notice at the end it says CD and NPM install. So essentially it's saying once we're in our folder, we should type the command npm install, which would download the modules that we need. So upon creating our express initial scaffold, it gives us a package.json, which specifies certain express packages that we'll need to download in order to actually run our app. 
So upon entering npm install in our current folder location, it will download Express, Body Parser, Cookie Parser, Morgan, Sir Favicon, Debug and Jade into a Node Modules folder. Okay, so we'll do that now. Our app.js file is the main entry point for starting our application. We'll go into each of these more in depth as the course goes on, but basically at the top here, we create a variable and require the express package. So we're able to require packages by just using the name of the package as it's defined in our package.json. So anytime that we see a require without any dots or dashes, Node will automatically look in our Node modules folder. So after installing these modules, meaning after I do npm install and it downloads everything, Node will automatically create a Node modules folder for everything that we've downloaded. And then we can simply require any of these by defining a variable and then requiring it into our app. These of course are just variables, we can name these anything. Instead of saying express, I could just say press. But typically, we'll use camel casing for the name of the package that we're using. All these packages contain modules that in turn contain their own JavaScript methods. So you can think of them a lot like underscore or jQuery. So jQuery and underscore have their own methods that they use that allows developers to easily handle JavaScript patterns. So after uh, requiring Express, we set Express to app. And after declaring app, we see various methods that have been attached to app, like set and use. Here we see get. As mentioned, there's a listen method that will start a server. When we scaffold an app with Express, it allows us to start our server using npm start. And you'll be able to see this in the package.json. So how Express likes to scaffold our apps for us is it provides a script that in order to start our server, it looks into the bin slash www file. So if we were to open that file up, we can see that this file ends up using the app.listen method that I alluded to earlier in order to start our server. So now that we've installed the node modules, we can type into the terminal npm start and it will load up our server. First, it looks in the bin ww file, and it should give us a message once it's loaded up our server. So this actually won't give us any message once our server has started, because there's no log for it. So we could say console log express. Okay, so we can just add very basic message to let us know that Express has started and we can go to should be port 3000 okay and we get a mess uh, welcome message saying welcome to Express and this is just a very basic message that's based on our Jade view engine but Express essentially ships with Jade. So let's take a look at what Jade looks like. Jade is basically a, a very trimmed down version of HTML. I personally don't really like Jade because if you don't have your spacing correct, then it throws errors. And if things aren't centered on the correct line, it will show up in weird places on your layout. And we can see on our index, it says extends layout. So it uses layout in the index page. 
and we'll take a look at this where it's setting a variable of title again we'll go into this more detail but it's setting our routes to be to use route slash index and it's setting this route slash index at the index location users is set to dash users so routes We'll have our index and our users.js. So users. So if we go to localhost slash users, it should we should get the message respond with the resource. If I do slash users, okay, we get respond with the resource. And just to show you how this works. If I change this to test on my server restart, if I go to dash users dash test, I will get respond with the resource. So I'll have to restart this. So this route should no longer work and we get a not found. But if we go to users slash test, I get my respond with the resource. This gives us an example of how we can pass variables. So when we navigate to our front page, we see welcome to express and we're setting the title variable to express in our routes file. Okay, so that concludes just a very basic introductory level lesson on what express is and how we create an initial scaffold. And then following videos, we'll be building our own Express app and learning what each one of these app.use and app.sets actually does. In this video, we'll discuss how to set up an Express server. First, we'll see how to easily create a server by using the listen method. Next, we'll look at some different ways that we can start our Express server. We'll learn how to configure NodeMon to auto restart our server on file changes. Finally, we'll introduce the concept of asynchronous programming. Let's start off by taking a look at configuring Express from the beginning. I've set up a new folder called Server. So in my terminal, I'm going to navigate to my new folder. The first thing that I want to do is create a package.json. So I can do this by saying npm init. I'm just going to hit enter a bunch of times until I get to the yes. So what this does is it creates a package.json. And the reason why I like to create a package.json initially is so that I can use the dash dash save flag when I'm installing any packages. So currently we don't see any packages in installed. I'm going to change my main entry point to app.js and save this. Now I'm going to create an app.js file. And I'm only going to install one package and that is express. We'll give it the dash dash save flag. Now you can see it was automatically added as a dependency into my package.json file right here. I prefer this method of using Express my applications as opposed to the automatic scaffolding because the scaffolding comes with some packages that I might not normally use, like Jade and it requires us to use the npm start to get our server going. The first thing that I'll do in my app.js file is require express. So I'll set a variable of express and require it. To use methods that are built into express, I'm going to create a variable called app. So the very first thing that we can do is we can create a server that will run on a port that we've defined. We can basically use any port on our local system that's greater than 80. 
so our machines use up to port 80. So we'll create a port of, call it 8000. Now to start a new server, all I need to do is call the app.listen, passing in my port. And to make sure that our server is actually started, on start, I'm going to log server started. Now to run this file and start our express server, I have a few different options. I can say node app or node app.js, either way. And we can see we get the log almost immediately server started. So there's actually a better way to pass in the message server started, and that's by using a callback. We'll talk a little bit more about synchronous versus asynchronous programming when we discuss more in detail some of the other methods that we can use for Express. However, the basic idea is that when we write code, it's rendered sequentially. So you might be under the impression that this file and that node itself is 100% asynchronous, which is not the case. This right here is all synchronous, meaning first we're creating a variable, then another variable, then another one, then we're creating a server, and then we're logging the message. So that if our server were to crash before getting to this log message, then we would never see this log message. So the whole great thing about asynchronous programming is that we can use callbacks. So if we put a callback right here, then we can log an error and a response. So then I can say if there's an error, I can say log server error. And I can use the standard else and log that my server started. So let's save this and double check that it's still working. Okay, and I still get my server started. So that's the, the whole concept of asynchronous programming is that we can use these functions as callbacks in many different places. And we can use these callbacks and asynchronous programming in general as a means of not hanging up the browser. And that's the whole point, is that we can send requests to a server and the user can keep on doing what they're doing, waiting for the data to come back to them. And so this is one way of starting a server. And this is my personal preference when creating an Express app is to create my app.listen at the bottom of my node, or I should say at the bottom of my app.js or express web application. We saw a different way in our previous example when we were auto-generating an express scaffold using the express command. So here's our old app.js, and you can see that in this version, there is no app.listen because instead there's a script set up in our in our package.json which allows us to use npm start so really it's a matter of preference so typically in my own apps i just like to use an anonymous function here and i don't generally pass any kinds of errors at least in the app.listen method and i'll just log for a success callback and then on top of that I prefer to use nodemon the benefit of using nodemon is it will automatically restart your server whenever changes are made in any of your server files after you save the file make sure that when you're installing nodemon use the dash g flag which will install nodemon globally. Now you'll be able to run nodemon using the nodemon command plus the name of our file which is app. It will start up our server and give us the server started message. Now if we change this to something else and then save the file 
it will automatically restart the server noticing that a file has changed. In this video, we'll discuss why the order of what's defined in our app.js file is very important. In doing so, we'll introduce the concept of mounted middleware. We'll then take a look at the bundled express packages of Morgan, Body Parser, and Cookie Parser. Finally, we'll take a look at how routing works in Express. In order to explain and demonstrate how the order in our main server file is important, I'm going to open up our app.js file from our starter app folder. The variables at the top define the packages that are shipped with the express auto-generated template. The routes and users variables define where we'll be creating our routes. We then define an app variable so that we can use express methods. And here is where you can find documentation on each of these methods under API reference version 4.x. Getting back to our file, we first see an app.set. This pretty much always comes first and will define our templating and where our view files will live. The only exception to this is when we have to actually declare an engine. So certain templates like Swig and Handlebars require us to declare what templating engine we're going to be using. Others, however, like Jade and EJS, don't actually require us to declare the engine. They only require that we set our views to the actual folder where our view files will live. Everything else below the set method can be described as middleware. Notice also that everything below uses the app.use method. Middleware can be thought of as any number of functions that are invoked by Express.js routing layer before your final request handler is made. So we're basically mounting any number of app.uses or functions in between the beginning of an HTTP request and the end of the HTTP response. And we'll have a full video to explain this concept in greater detail. For now, understand that the order in which we are defining our app.uses determines which one gets called first. So a very common example of how this works is the popular module called Express Session. Express Session basically tracks user activity and you can log certain requests based on that and it depends on cookie parser. So if you were using an earlier version of Express Sessions up until version 1.5 you would have to declare cookie parser first. If we were to use express session up above here, and again, this would be after that we downloaded and required this particular module, then we try to use it above before using cookie parser, then it would throw an error. So the idea is that each one of these uses is mounted before the other. So moving on to defining what some of these other packages that we've included in Express actually do, we see app.use logger, and logger is the variable that we've defined from Morgan up here. So Morgan is a middleware that's going to log data into our console. So when we turn on our server and navigate to our URL, it will give us information back to the console of whether we're using gets or puts or deletes. So I've currently started this server and as you can see 
on our console that's logging get dash three or four and the amount of time that it's taking to navigate to this to this route and download the style sheets and the favorite column which isn't there. So all this logging information is a result of logger or Morgan. Next is body parser and body parser basically allows us to use the request.body to retrieve data from the front end. So in many express examples if we're getting form data or if we're passing certain objects from our front end in order to grab them we're using the request.body middleware function. Next the express.static method gives us access to the public folder so that we can use everything in that folder like our CSS, JS, images, etc. So it allows us to use everything in this file right here. At the bottom here, we're defining an app.use to look for the definition of our routes. So up above, we declared a variable of routes and users to look in our routes folder at our index file to define routes at the index, or you could say the main entry point of our app itself. So when we do that, when we look in our route slash index file, we're defining one route at the base of our URL or the index of our URL. And we're rendering, in this instance, our index view file. So this is using the router method, which is just a convenience. It's a way to abstract out routes into a separate file instead of defining everything within one large app file. This router was created in Express 4, and as mentioned, it's just convenience. We don't have to define our routes that way. We could define everything in the same file, and we could instead use the app.get. So this is ex essentially the same code that we find in our index.js, except we're using the app.get, but it's, it's equivalent. And you can see that it's equivalent because I just changed the message instead of, instead of saying express, I changed the message to welcome to express, and you can see that we're getting welcome to express. In this instance, we're using app.get, but all of the restful verbs apply and are available to us. So we could use get, put, post, and delete verbs as well. In this video, we'll go into greater detail of what middleware really means and provide some examples. We can define middleware as any number of functions that are invoked by the Express.js routing layer before your final request handler is made. So essentially we're saying that on our defined route, do something first, then pass it along to the next function. Each time we will use the request and response objects of the HTTP cycle in order to alter and or pass to the next whatever it is that we're handling. So in this example, before sending someone to the route that they request, we would deal with any cores or CSRF issues that may arise. We check to see if the user was authorized for that route. And if it is all good, then we would send them to where they want to go. And this is what a pseudocode example would look like for the previous image. Now, let's take a look at a more real world example. Here, I've defined a route located at backslash upload. Now, I only want authorized users to be able to navigate to this route. So what I've done is I've added an auth.isAuthenticated method 
as a piece of middleware. So is authenticated is a function that does the work of checking whether or not the user is logged in. And if they are logged in, then we'll pass them along to the next piece of middleware, which is a controller.upload. And in this instance, we'll handle our uploads. This is what the is authenticated function looks like. Don't get too bogged down in the code, as all it's doing is checking if the user has a valid JWT token and then passing them along. Notice though, we see a next parameter. All middleware functions carry this optional parameter, which is needed when passing along the request to the next function in the chain. The next function in the chain is controller.upload. So the controller.upload function might look something like this. And notice how it does not need the next parameter because it is the last function in the chain. So now we'll look at a few more simple examples that should really hammer home the concept of middleware. So in our server folder, remember the server folder is the one that has just a basic setup for a server. We'll create a new file called middleware-ex. So we'll open it up and copy over what's currently in our app.js file. In our other app.js folder, which contained our express scaffold, you probably remember seeing a bunch of app.uses. App.use, and then we passed in body parser and cookie parser, etc. And then towards the end, we talked about how we can create routes using the app.get method, which looks something like this. And I wanted to point out the difference between these. So the difference is when we declare app.use, this will run middleware on all requests. So every time we're navigating to this root index as defined by app.get, we're going to run body parser, cookie parser, and whatever else that we defined above using app.use. What we'll see in a moment is I'm going to create some middleware functions that we can pass in directly to this get method that will run exclusively on this particular URL request. So let's create those two middleware functions so I can show you how this actually works. Since JavaScript uses hoisting, we can really declare these functions wherever we want in our file and know that the functions will get hoisted to the top of our file. This log function will print to the console the date, the method that we use, whether it's a get, a put, or post method, and the URL that we navigate to. The hello function will write to our browser the words hello world. In both instances, we're passing in this next parameter to make sure that we move on to the next function in our middleware chain. So above, instead of rendering anything, I'm just going to pass in our two middleware functions and we'll see what happens. So I'm going to save this and I'm going to type into my node console node middleware dash ex. I'm going to navigate to our port and hopefully get these messages. Okay, so we see we wrote to our browser hello world, which is what I was expecting, and we printed out the date, the method, which is this request.method, and the URL, which was the request.url. And notice how we're passing both of these middleware functions into our route. In both instances, we're using this next parameter. However, with the log function, it's optional. So I could comment this out and it would 
work just the same. Now I'm going to show you that what if we were to use, as I explained earlier, app.use. So if I, at the top of this, did app.use, and then if I used our middleware that we created, which was called log, I'm going to expect the console to print out the date, the method, and the URL twice. Once because it gets passed in every time regardless because we've declared app.use and again because we're specifying that we want it to be used within our get request. So we'll kill the server and restart it. And I have to refresh the page. Okay, great. And you see it gets logged two times. Okay, so with that, you should now have a pretty good understanding of how and why and when we use middleware in Express.js. Welcome back. In this video, we'll discuss templating options available to us in Express.js. First, we'll look at how to set up our template framework using the engine and set methods. We'll see how to set directory locations for reading the view files and other static content. Next, we'll take a look at a few of the more popular options such as Jade, EJS, Swig, and Handlebars. Finally, we'll see what's involved in setting a project without templating for use with frameworks like Angular and React. For this video, we'll use the starter app template as our example. So if we open up our app.js file, right here, we have defined and set our view engine as Jade. And the way that we're able to use our Jade files is that we define a string called views as our first parameter. And the second parameter tells our view engine where to look for to find our Jade files. So we can open up one of our Jade files. And Jade basically always extends a layout. And the layout is just going to include the scripts, such as style sheets or other scripts that have been included. Jade, as you can see, is just a very stripped down version of HTML and its rendering is defined by spacing. So we can space our items by either a single space or a double space. It just has to be congruent all the way through our file. I'm personally not a big fan of Jade because if you don't have your spacing correct, then it tends to break what you see within the view. But it is the template that is shipped with Express mostly because it was created by TJ Holowaychuk, who also created Express. Another view engine that's very easy to set up is EJS. So as you can see, it's the same as Jade as far as declaring our view engine, and then we just name it EJS. We typically declare where our views are going to be above, And in this instance, we're not, we don't have to use the path.join. So I've seen this used both ways. It seems that you can just define where your views are going to live, and that works. Then other times I've seen developers use path.join, pass in the double underscore directory name, and views. You see this a lot more, where we're defining express.static, and then path.join to tell our engine where to look for in order to find files that we're going to be using for our projects such as the images and the CSS. So now we'll look at the EJS template, what it looks like. EJS, you can find a little bit more about EJS by obviously doing a Google search and this is one of the first results. It gives you a lot of good information about 
how to use EJS. Most of these templates have one major purpose, and that's for looping through a collection of items and then displaying those items on the page. So you can see that being integrated into this EJS template that I opened up right here. So this would be looping through a number of books and then displaying the book's title, the book's author. Probably one of the main reasons why I don't like really to use EJS either is because there doesn't seem to be a Sublime Text plugin that works well. So I always get this kind of ugly looking colors and big red bar here whenever I'm loading up any EJS files. Another templating engine that I do like to use a lot is Swig. So this is what Swig looks like. When using Swig and Handlebars, we do have to use the app.engine and this will basically define our extension. So because we could use different extensions for these templates, we have to define them. I really like using Swig because it allows us to loop through the data in a very easy to use syntax. So swig is over here. And basically if we're looping through an array, it allows us to use this kind of syntax, which is slightly similar to what we saw in EJS. I prefer to use it because we're using the curly bra brackets in order to display our data, which is very Angular-like, and I like Angular. And otherwise, it's very simple. So it still has a fairly decent API of what you can actually display in your browser. So we can take a look at an example Swig file. And for this one, right up here at the top, I'm using some code in order to loop through bunny and bunnies. So if I have three bunnies in my database that have some information about each bunny, such as a member name, a date created, a title, a description, this will grab all the bunnies and loop through each one of them and display whatever it is that I want displayed. And this is the same syntax as you would find when using Angular. And all, I have, and all I have to do is use this to loop through them and use the end for to end the loop. And another very robust templating engine that we could use is Handlebars. So Handlebars would look something like this. And similar to Swig, we need to define our extension and that's what this does some of the times you'll see HBS or handlebars either one and then we're setting our view engine to actually be handlebars right here so handlebars allows us to use the curly brackets similar to what we found in swig however you do have a much more developed API with handlebars so again this is just kind of an example handlebars file and this one as you can see the extension is HTML so we can use handlebars as uh, HTML as well and you can certainly find out more about handlebars just from their NPM and github pages So the options when using a view layer and node is you either use one of these templates that we just mentioned or you don't really have to use any of these. So if you wanted to use 
a JavaScript framework like Angular, which just uses HTML, all you would have to do is use an express.static as we see right here. And then in the public folder, we would put our index file. So in our starter app file, we see a public folder. And basically, we wouldn't set up our engine. We would just include an index file. And then that would include our JavaScripts. And that would be another way of controlling what we see within our view. We can define our routes using standard get, put, post, and delete verbs. Our first parameter sets the location of our route. Our second parameter is a function that accepts a request and response object. The request object represents incoming HTTP requests. The response object is something you give to the user, such as a web page, an image, or data like JSON or XML. In the example below, when a GET request is made to our root URL, we respond by rendering our index file located in our views folder. We're able to use the params method of the request object to retrieve available parameters from an HTTP request. In the example below, we pass the 99 parameter from the URL and use it to display in a string message. This time, we're using the send method to display a string and attaching it to the parameter's request object. Express4 brought us the router API. By using router, we're able to use the same get, put, post, and delete verbiage while being able to easily extract away the location of our routes. So, instead of defining app.use 100 times in the same app.js file for each route, we can declare it just once and point to the location of our route definition. This allows for clear handling of our API. Let's take a look at a typical setup so you can better understand the structure. App.js will start up our server and assign our routing. The views folder will house our J files, which will appear in our browser. And the API folder will contain an index and a controller to define each route. After declaring our app variables, we set our templating engine and the location of our J files. The next line will declare a backslash API as the new route and require in the index file located in our API folder. Do you see how it's doing that? You can tell it's requiring in a folder because of the dot and that it's requiring in the index file at the root of the folder. So it's requiring in the index.js from the API folder. In our index.js file, we bring in express so that we can create a router. And we're requiring in a controller to make for clear separation. So this file is setting its root URL, which we've defined already as backslash API and passing in controller.main. The controller file exports a method that we use in our index file. Now this is simply shorthand. We don't have to do this. Just like how we could define all of this in our app.js file, but then we wouldn't have a modular app anymore. This res.render looks very familiar. It's saying render the index file, which we've defined in our views folder, and it's passing in an object with the key, title, and value of express. This will match what we find in our jade file here.
and when we run the app and navigate to localhost 8080 slash API, we can see the result. As mentioned, using the controller is just shorthand. We could declare our route like this. This is the same as what we've already declared in the controller file, except we're changing express to my home page and we should see the difference. And we do.